Hello, and welcome to our webcast, which is brought to you by the Knowledge Translation for Employment Research Center, or the Cater Center, which is housed at the American Institutes for Research. I'm your host, Ann Outlaw. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some logistics. You can find information, including the presentation slides and a text description of these slides on our website at cater.org. Closed captioning is available. If you're watching this webcast on YouTube, you can simply press the CC button on the bottom right side of the screen. This is an on-demand webcast, so if you have questions for our presenters, please email me at aoutlaw at AIR.org, and I'll convey your message. And you can also ask your questions in the evaluation form, which I'll provide a little later at the end of today's webcast. Today we'll hear an update about the translating evidence about traumatic brain injury to practice within Washington State Department of Corrections, which is funded by the National Institute for Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDLER. This project is one of a handful of projects funded by NIDLER for translating disability and rehabilitation research into practice. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Mark Harness is the PI of this project and the Associate Director of the University of Washington Center for Technology and Disability Studies. He is also an Associate Professor in Rehabilitation Medicine with a background in the design and development of instructional and assistive technologies for people with disabilities. Currently, he is also the co-director of the Nidler-funded ADA Knowledge Translation Center with lead responsibility in knowledge man management and technology. So thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Are you ready to begin? Yes. Thanks so much for the introduction. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to be presenting on a project um, that is now in, a, in the middle of its second year, I believe. Um, and uh, this project has been in collaboration with my colleagues Eva Larari, Sherry Brown, Kurt Johnson, uh, and not listed here is Becky Matter, who is not on the project anymore, but who's helped a lot with the work that's uh, gone on so far. Before I jump into updates about the project, I thought I'd start with a little bit of a, uh, a review about why the project was important and a little bit of a discussion about the organization of the project. And then I'll, I'll talk about the work that's happened since the last webinar um, that we had. So to begin, um, this project is focused on traumatic brain injury. And traumatic brain injury is a significant issue in the United States. If we look at the most recent 2010 estimates, we see that about 2.8 million brain injuries are reported every year. Most people survive a brain injury. 98% of people will survive. And many will recover within a few weeks and have little to no effect. But some will have uh, challenges for many years or uh, even for the rest of their lives. If those national estimates hold true for our state, Washington state, then there are about 63,000 TBI-related injuries every year. And of those cases, uh, about 1,130 individuals die from their injuries. It's interesting to note that although there are a lot of TBIs in community se settings um, and people who have uh, experienced TBIs and live with uh, outcomes related to having a TBI, that if you look broadly, about 8.5% of Americans reported traumatic brain injury. When you look inside of correctional facilities, however, those numbers are quite a bit higher. We don't have really good data about what they are because many people who have had traumatic brain injuries are not identified uh, in correctional settings. But the estimates range from 30 to 70%, so somewhere around our guess is 60% of people in correctional settings have experienced a TBI, so a significant number. If you take those, those percentages and you apply them to DOC staff, Department of Corrections staff, and uh, incarcerated individuals in Washington State, um, then given the numbers of staff that we have in the Washington State DOC, about 730 staff members have had a TBI. Uh, and as many as uh, almost 22,000 in, uh, incarcerated individuals have had a TBI. So TBI is uh, a big issue in correctional settings, but it's, um, it's one that is 
not well understood in terms of how it affects incarcerated individuals. And it's one where there's not a lot of uh, focus on improving uh, interactions and services for people who have had traumatic brain injuries. You all probably know that TBI can affect people in, in many different ways. Um, and although these, these kinds of effects can be challenging for people in community settings, they present different kinds of challenges in correctional settings. So TBI can have cognitive effects uh, in terms of difficulty, kind of executive function issues, in terms of difficulty uh, in memory and planning and understanding. Um, in correctional settings, this can be a problem if uh, an incarcerated individual is expected to um, remember something and follow an order and show up somewhere on time and they forget. So for example, if they're supposed to be to a dental appointment um, and they um, forget to, to, to follow through on that, um, they can find themselves infracted, so receiving an infraction. And so um, cognitive issues can affect folks um, in the similar ways to how they affect folks in the community, but there can be different kinds of um, outcomes from, from those lapses. TBI can affect people emotionally. Uh, in particular, problems with emotional control can be challenging in correctional settings. If you're someone who has a lot of emotional lability, who becomes angry very quickly, um, and without a lot of control of that anger, um, that can play out in really negative ways in correctional settings. And again, could result in, in infractions, could result in placement in more isolated settings, um, could even potentially result in longer settings, uh, lo longer sentences, um, or, uh, or, or not being able to have reductions in sentences for good behavior. We know that it affects, can affect people socially so that they may engage in inappropriate or unusual social behavior or not be able to read social cues well. And obviously, in correctional settings, you're in complicated social environments where you are together with a lot of people that you may not have chosen to be with, and so managing social behavior is important. It can affect people physically. Um, there can be issues related to pain, to balance, challenges with speech. People can have seizures. And these all suggest uh, that there is a need for certain kinds of health services um, that, that it understands uh, the effect of traumatic brain injury. And finally, it can affect people in terms of their sensory experience. Um, so sensitivity to light and noise, um, loss of hearing, um, challenges in visual processing. In correctional settings, this is, is challenging because these settings are often very loud. Um, you don't have a lot of control over noise. Um, and they also tend to be lit quite brightly um, and to um, have fluorescent lights and so forth. Um, and and um, folks who are incarcerated don't uh, aren't allowed to make choices about wearing baseball caps, for example, or earmuffs, or those kinds of things that some people do out in the community to reduce the sensory experience. So there are lots of ways that TBI affects people um, that become more challenging within correctional settings. We don't know a lot about people with TBI in correctional settings. The research that we have. Um, is limited, but, but it suggests that, that um, people with TBI have higher rates of recidivism. That means that if, if you identify somebody with TBI who is incarcerated and ask them if they've been incarcerated before, uh, they, they have been at higher rates. They're heavier users of medical and psychological services, so there's kind of a suggestion there that there is an, a need, perhaps an unmet need, that's trying to be met through medical and psychological services. They're less able to maintain rule-abiding behavior. Uh, and obviously, that's not OK in correctional settings and results in negative kinds of outcomes for, uh, for folks with TBI. And they're less likely to complete chemical dependency programs. We know that, that there, there is a relationship between um, substance abuse and traumatic brain injury um, and a relationship between substance abuse and incarceration. And so it, it seems that the chemical dependency programs that are in place perhaps don't, um, don't accommodate the needs of folks with TBI. Um, and, and so folks are less successful in those programs. So that's about, that's kind of focused, research focused on incarcerated individuals. There's not a lot about um, frontline staff and what they know about people with TBI. Um, there is a lot 
of anecdotal evidence that suggests they have very limited understanding of those of the challenges that people with TBI faced and how to best interact with them. And so because of that, uh, we proposed this project. And uh, in this project, we're working very closely with partners in the, in the Washington State uh, Department of Corrections. And the goal is to, to translate uh, evidence about traumatic brain injury into practice in that setting. We're focusing specifically on frontline staff, um, correctional officers in, who, who are serving in correctional facilities, health services staff who may see people with TBI in their, um, in their uh, line of work, and then uh, community corrections officers, so officers who are that interface between the community and the correctional setting. All of these people, though, are people who regu regularly work with incarcerated individuals with TBI. Um, and the project's broken out this way. We have two tracks. Um, track one, which we're still in the process of finishing, was really focused on system-wide KT interventions to increase TBI knowledge of frontline staff. And we, we engaged in two activities in this track. We did a gap analysis or a needs analysis and uh, developed some knowledge translation plans. And then we, um, out of that planning, uh, we developed and implemented training well, training plans, and we have now moved to where we have training in place with DOC. This is really an attempt to develop basic uh, understanding uh, in a broad number of folks who work in corrections about TBI, and then uh, to move on to a little bit more intermediate kind of training and, uh, and education. From there, though, the plan is to move into a second track where we'll engage in an intensive pilot over the last uh, two and a half years of the project, where we'll translate um, what we've learned uh, about TBI in correctional settings to practice within a subgroup. It could be with veterans. It could be in a specific facility, like the women's facility. That's still to be decided. But the idea is to really um, kind of trial some ideas about how we could help better improve interactions between frontline staff and people with TBI. So let me tell you a little bit about the gap analysis and the KT planning that we engaged in. Um, we, we did a lot of meeting and um, relationship building and spent a lot of time just trying to understand the context. So we, uh, we came into this project without a lot of experience in correctional settings, um, but with a strong background in rehabilitation and traumatic brain injury. And so, um, We've, we've really tried to develop a relationship with folks in the Department of Corrections that is, um, is respects the different knowledge that each of us brings. So correctional settings are, are very unique, um, and they have a lot of constraints that we're not um, familiar with in, a, in our community dwelling lives. And there are a lot of um, safety concerns, and there are a lot of um, sort of uh, uh, relationships in terms of how staff work and um, how um, and, and the different kinds of facilities where um, people with people who are incarcerated are kept um, so we, we really needed to, to come in with that perspective and develop these relationships so we met with DOC leadership um, we spent quite a bit of time with the DOC training and development unit which is is a significant um, significant sized staff um, because there's a lot of training that happens within corrections. We interviewed experts on TBI. And then in our team, we engaged in ongoing process reflection. So capturing notes from all of our meetings, including our own meetings, taking those notes and trying to compile them and, and to understand um, what we were learning. We also engaged in some materials collection and review. We took a run through NARIC to see what, what had happened in Nidler related to TBI and corrections. And then we ourselves participated in Department of Correction trainings to understand how those worked, um, how people received trainings, what people, uh, kind of what the expectation was about training. Then we also uh, engaged in a number of site visits. So we went to four correctional facilities. Um, we went to the Washington Correction Center, um, which houses uh, what's called the Cedar Hall Skill Building Unit. Um, this, is, this is what is called mission housing. It's, it's housing that's focused on a specific population. And this one, uh, Cedar Hall, is focused on individuals with developmental disabilities. So it was helpful to understand how Department of Corrections thinks about um, 
populations who have cognitive disabilities. Um, uh, and so um, that was a useful site for us to, to connect with. We also went to the Monroe Correctional Complex. And while we were there, we went to the Trin Twin Rivers facility, which is a fairly kind of standard um, correctional facility. But we also visited this, what they call the Special Offender Unit. These are individuals with significant mental health challenges. This is the psychiatric unit. And so again, another important place for us to visit to understand um, how DOC works with people who have um, special considerations. And then we went to a place called Stafford Creek. Um, another example of mission housing, this is uh, mission housing where veterans are served. So if you were a veteran, uh, you can choose to, to be in this, uh, they call it a veterans pod. Um, and they found that veterans um, work together better with other veterans, that the facilities work more smoothly um, with um, incarcerated individuals who've had similar experiences and who can, and, and similar kinds of military um, experience. And finally, we went to the Washington Correctional Center for Women. Um, as you may know, um, the majority of people who are incarcerated are men. There, there are lots of facilities across Washington State that, that house um, men. There's a single facility that houses women. The Correctional Center for Women is, is an interesting place in the sense that all levels of security are in that single facility. And so um, interesting to go there because they also have some um, initiatives that are related like uh, trauma-informed care and so forth. So we visited all those sites, captured lots of notes, um, and tried to understand um, how to think about TBI within the Department of Corrections. Some very sim simple uh, or, or summaries of our findings are that, first of all, it just became clear that, you know, the, the Department of Correction is not sort of one unified thing. It's this, this really large, complex organization. Each of the facilities are very different. Um, they all house um, people who are considered to be different levels of risk. Um, they, and at different points in serving their sentences, they have staff who are very different because of that. Um, and so we, we can't think about knowledge translation in a unidimensional way to the Department of Corrections. We have to think about it at a, a more uh, molecular level. We also realize that staff members in DOC are, are within themselves very different. So we can roughly divide them into um, administration, correctional officers, and health services. And each of those categories bring a very different perspective to their interactions with incarcerated individuals. Um, as you can imagine, correctional staff are, uh, are really engaged in a day-to-day frontline interaction with incarcerated individuals. Um, and for them, safety is, a, is a, a very important concern. Folks who are in health services certainly hold that perspective, but they also um, come from disciplines that are more about uh, rehabilitation and care. And then administration has, of course, a much higher level sense of kind of managing community safety, ensuring that the DOC politically stays within its bounds and so forth. So very different kinds of, of perspectives on, on um, issues related to incarcerated individuals. Um, and then another finding just that, that we realize is that although there are these broad perspectives, um, the, the general purpose of placement in a correctional setting is about community safety. Um, and there's an aspect also of ensuring that individuals who have um, received a sentence because of their crimes serve their sentence. So there's, a, there's a, a value related to justice being served. So community safety is probably the biggest um, kind of dynamic that, or, or principle that we see playing out. It's even in the mission statement of the Department of Corrections. Um, so there, there, there is some um, capacity for for focusing on rehabilitation, and many people in Department of Corrections believe that, that there is a rehabilitative component, but safety um, and justice um, really come to the fore. And finally, um, we realized that uh, in order for us to be successful in doing work in the Department of Corrections, that we're gonna, we, will, we would really need to understand the motivations of correctional staff. And as I noted, safety is the top priority. So 
for us, what we've been doing is really trying to frame our suggestions within the context of how knowing more about traumatic brain injury can help to improve staff safety. Um, so if you know ways to de-escalate situations with somebody who maybe becomes angry very quickly, that's going to be a safer situation for you as a staff person. You're going to have less hassle. It's going to make your day better. And so we've really focused on, 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 on understanding what staff are you know, most concerned about and trying to frame interventions or, or recommended changes and strategies within that context. And then also just trying to use the language that they use, so focusing more on behavior management than on, for example, rehab. Um, we did find in, those, in that needs analysis that there really isn't much TBI knowledge among many staff, that they don't come with a sense that we have in the community about universal design and accommodations and making modifications, um, that that's not, a, not something that's part of the dynamic. Um, there is not a lot of individualization in correctional settings for um, incarcerated individuals. And when you start talking about individualization, people get really nervous you know, different kinds of interactions for, for uh, incarcerated individuals with TBI versus others. So, so that idea um, is, is not a big part of, of the correctional setting. Um, the other thing we realize is that, that staff in corrections receive a ton of training already. Um, there are heavy training demands, ongoing training demands, and that anything that we do would have to fit within that context. Um, but that encouraging Encouragingly, there are some other initiatives that mirror the work that we're doing. I mentioned trauma-informed care, um, and so there are there there is potential for change. So that was the needs analysis, and out of that, we we felt very lucky through our work with the training and development unit to be um, given the opportunity to develop an e-course, a web-based course, um, and they uh, they worked with us to develop the the framework of that course. They actually gave us a lot of feedback as we developed it. Um, and then they agreed to uh, insert it into their in-service um, training. And this is training that every staff member in the Department of Corrections is required to take on an annual basis. So this course um, was, was intended to help all Department of Corrections staff, but especially frontline staff, understand what a TBI is how incarcerated individuals and Department of Correction staff might be affected by TBI, and then sort of a universal precautions. What could they do day to day to improve interactions and increase safety? Um, and then just to try to motivate staff to learn more about TBI. It was a 45 minute course. It includes slides, quizzes, infographics, animations, and videos. And um, at this time, I'd like to show you the introductory video for the course to have a sense for how we, we framed it. A lot of times people that don't have a brain injury, they look at you and they see you, you look fine. You walk and talk and quack like a duck, everything seems to be normal. But inside the brain there, it's damaged. Traumatic brain injury in the Department of Corrections. Traumatic brain injury, or TBI, is a major health issue in the United States with roughly 2.8 million brain injuries reported each year. TBI is not visible and can result in a lifelong disability. So traumatic brain injury is an equal opportunity problem. It happens um, with people with car accidents to skiing accidents. When there's a traumatic brain injury, there's a point of impact that causes damage to part of the brain. People may have very little impact, but they can end up with permanent lifelong changes in how they think, how their brain works because of it. One of the things about brain injury is that from the outside looking in, you can't see it. The only way you can know it is from the individual's description of it or by observing behavior. TBI is an even bigger problem in correctional settings, affecting a large percentage of both offenders and staff. TBIs, I think, are pretty high in our facility. And so I think people are dealing with them every day, but they don't know it. And so I don't think that, it, I think that they are like experiencing it, but I don't think that they're aware that that's what they're experiencing. So I think the more information out there would be better. 
one of the things that we know from current research is that um, individuals who um, have had a traumatic brain injury uh, tend to be more highly represented in the prison population um, and more likely to um, end up back in prison once they get out. Within the prison population, every statistic I've seen is between 30 to 70 percent, which is kind of a big gap, but that says that at least a third of every single person you run into is going to have a traumatic brain injury. My name is Jeff Hartson, and I'm a retired correctional officer from California. I worked uh, 14, 15 years at Pelican Bay State Prison in Crescent City as a correctional officer and I was medically retired due to my brain injury in 2003. I had symptoms of TBI um, with the panic, with the um, loss of control, the loss of direction, the um, memory, finding my words. Uh, as far as symptoms I've experienced were fatigue, uh, irritability, a lot of irritability, uh, a lot of sensitivity to light, uh, to sounds. It's been my experience touring correctional facilities that they're noisy, the lighting is stark, there's a lot going on, and these are the conditions that are among the most difficult for people who've had brain injuries when they need to make a decision or need to decide on a plan of action. But there are things you can do to make your work safer and more effective. If the guy's having a meltdown due to a brain injury, then you know, take a minute or so, take whatever time you need to address that. Uh, it's an officer safety issue as well because you don't know what kind of issue this guy's dealing with. Um, I think that in order to um, approach people in a quieter manner, giving people time to respond, taking that extra beat to wait for somebody to respond rather than kind of escalating things would be very helpful. And again, I think these ten tend to work with a lot of people, whether you have a brain injury or not treat everyone like they might have TBI at first. And so ask them the questions, talk slow, and bring an incident down to a manageable level. If you start everything that way, you probably will bring it down to a reasonable level um, in creating a safer environment and workplace for all of us, not only for the offenders, but for the staff. I think what's in it for the custody officers is a safer and less stressful shift. So in general, if we all have a couple interventions that we can use with these folks with TBIs that will help them not escalate, will help them get to their appointments, will help them not ask questions over and over again. Those sort of things will reduce um, the stress they're putting on the custody officers and on the living unit staff, and that will make a better shift, a safer shift, an easier shift. This course will teach you about TBI within corrections. So now that that course is in process, um, we about 4,500 of the Department of Corrections staff have taken it at this point, and hopefully the rest will be, take it before the end of the year. Um, we're moving into a phase of the project where we wanted to provide more intermediate level training. So we are we're progressing on two two tracks here. Um, one thing that we'll be doing in March is a a training for ADA coordinators. This will be all facility level ADA coordinators who serve in the Washington Department of Corrections. So the DOC has a uh, state level coordinator and it also has facility level coordinators for each um, facility. And in that training, what we'll be doing is it's really going to the next level. So again, um, going a little more depth into what t is TBI and how does it affect people. But then what's unique about correctional settings that make these challenges difficult for people with TBI and how do we connect that to appropriate accommodations that they have rights to under the Americans with Disabilities Act? And, and how do we identify accommodations that are going to be acceptable and functional within corrections? So trying to get these, these coordinators, these uh, ADA coordinators, um, really up to speed with TBI so that they understand what it is but also begin to really conceptualize, you know, how do we think about accommodations? Because there's been a lot of work, at least in the Washington State DOC, that's focused on architectural barrier removal, lots of site visits to, to make sure that the sites themselves are accessible for people with mobility challenges, but not so much focused on accommodations for people with um, uh, cognitive disability. 
The second thing that we're doing and, and are really pleased about is, the, is we're interacting with a newly formed TBI task force. So the task force came out of a, of a set of discussions about really where would be the, the most appropriate level to intervene with more advanced training. And what we were told is that because the DOC is quite hi hierarchical in organization, that um, if we didn't get leadership on board, and make sure that leadership valued this um, issue, understood this issue, and could support any kinds of um, changes that in, in process moving forward that we weren't going to, to go very far. And so the TBI task force, um, which was really facilitated, facilitated by uh, Risa Clem, who's the state level ADA coordinator, is a mechanism for informing and educating DOC leadership about TBI and supporting a decision-making process that's focused on traumatic brain injury in the Department of Corrections. And so um, the TBI task force is built from members who come across from across the Department of Corrections, people from health services, ADA compliance, mission housing, there's uh, correctional officers, classification officers. These are officers who um, help define um, placement for incarcerated individuals, in particular related to, um, to levels of security. Um, there are mental health folks. Uh, there's someone from death services. So uh, a pretty broad range of people, pretty high level, um, who are all engaging around the question of, um, first of all, uh, how do we understand TBI within our DOC? Um, what might we do to address those challenges? And then hopefully for our project, developing a plan for a pilot study to test some of the recommendations. Um, we had our first meeting just uh, last week, actually. Um, and some of the ideas that are coming out of the TBI task force are that we um, consider approaches um, at two levels so that we think about, certainly about ongoing work with staff to help them understand TBI and to, to think about improving interactions, but that we also think about providing more information to incarcerated individuals about TBI and to their families. Um, and the idea there is that, um, you know, a lot of folks, as I noted, um, may have had the experience of TBI, but may not make the connection between that experience or multiple experiences, which is, is more common for folks who are incarcerated, uh, multiple TBIs. Um, they may not make that connection between that, that um, incident and um, issues that they may be facing related to sensory challenges or cognitive challenges. And so they, the, the, the task force thought working on both of these levels would make sense. There's discussion about sort of differentiating approaches for those with severe versus more mild or moderate TBI. Um, for folks with more severe TBI, they, they tend to be picked up in health services in DOC and receive care there. So there's some more specialized work that happens there. Um, and then for folks with more moderate to mild TBI, um, they may not even be, it may not be something that correctional staff even know. So, so focusing more on kind of universal pr approaches, how do you deal with somebody who engages in these types of behaviors um, and what, what might uh, be better ways to interact with them? They also um, highlighted that there are ways that we can begin to collect better data and share those data for staff. They have a new record keeping system um, where they have a, a behavioral tab. And so thinking about how do they capture behavioral data in, in that record keeping system. So as an incarcerated individual moves across the system, and there is a lot of mobility between facilities, that as that person moves, that staff have a, a way of understanding um, what's going on with that individual better. Certainly, um, integrating more training opportunities into more places was part of the recommendation. Also, linking to volunteer communities like the brain injury organizations that are out in Washington State to use some of those resources. And then, um, and as part of that, maybe even supporting some um, peer development of some peer groups for people with uh, TBI in, in who are incarcerated. And finally, to think about exist, integrating uh, the work into existing approaches. So there's, there's something called a redemption model, uh, and there's training that goes on around that model. And as I mentioned, the trauma-informed care piece is there as well. So to wrap up, um, the next steps are that the task force will develop a charter, so mission, goals, outcomes, et cetera. 
Um, we'll engage in some more information finding um, to identify possible points of intervention, develop priorities with a timeline, and then out of that we'll hopefully come to phase two pilot. So that's an update on the work to date for this project. Um, certainly if you have questions, feel free to contact us um, through the email that's listed here um, or take a look at our website. And Anna, I'll turn it back to you. Hey, thank you so much, Mark, um, for sharing this update about your project. It's an important topic, and I look forward to hearing updates of the next steps of your project in the next year or so. So before we close today, I just wanted to invite all of you who are listening online to fill out this brief evaluation form. Uh, if you registered for this webinar, I'll go ahead and email you the evaluation form, or you can go ahead and find it on our website at cater.org. And you can ask questions about this project uh, to Mark on the evaluation, or you can go ahead and email me at aal.air.org. Um, and of course, Mark shared the email address on the slide before. So thank you again, Mark. And I'd also like to thank um, our funder, which is the National Institute for Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research for uh, to support this webcast and our other center's activities. So thank you and have a good day.